Um, good afternoon, everybody. Can I first of all say what a great pleasure it is to be here, and thank you to Oliver and Joe for inviting me. It's my first time in this part of the world, and I must say it's extremely beautiful, and I think you're very lucky to live around here. Um, Oliver has asked me to sort of put your hill fort and your work into some kind of wider context, so I'm actually going to give two short talks. One, the first one is on work I did recently on hill forts of the Ridgeway in central England, in Oxfordshire, and the second talk will be about my current excavations of a hill fort in North Wales called Malikaya Bhattavari. Um, in case you're wondering, this is the Offington White Horse, which some of you may be familiar with. It's one of, it, it is the only dated um, chalk figure that is prehistoric. Um, the jockey is a recent sort of addition, as you may have realised, and it was in fact an advertising stunt for a company um, that the National, Trust, the National Trust agreed to, but it was done in foam, so it, it disappeared fairly rapidly, I'm pleased to say. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about three excavations. Th this is relatively old work. Um, it's been published in three volumes, one for each of the sites I'm going to talk about, which are Offington Castle, um, Segsbury Camp, and Alfred's Castle. Now, just in case you're not familiar with this part of the world, this is the Ridgeway, which is a, su a supposedly prehistoric trackway running along the northern scarp of the Wessex Chalk Downlands. So, south of this dotted line, are chalk downlands. North of it is the much lower lying uh, Vale of the White Horse with a completely different geology. You can see that there's lots of other hill forts scattered around here and the dating of the Ridgeway is usually based on its association with prehistoric monuments. There's a sort of correlation all the way along the Ridgeway with round barrows and hill forts and various other things. But as you'll hear in a few minutes, we did actually date the Ridgeway at Huffington Castle into the early Roman period. So I'm going to concentrate, I'm going to talk about each of these three sites in turn and concentrate on the Romano-British aspects. But of course I do need to say a little bit about the Iron Age as well as we go through this. Now one of the reasons why we chose this area to work Firstly, because it's close to Oxford and it was a training excavation for Oxford students, but also because there's been a fair amount of other work done in this area and we wanted to pull all of this together. Um, so, for example, Liddington Camp, which is on the Ridgeway, Geophysics by English Heritage. This is an important initiative, the English Heritage, but it's now called Historic England, National Mapping Programme, this is Segsbury Camp, one of the sites I'll be talking about. And notice these extensive field systems south of Segsbury, which have been mapped from aerial photographs. Very little to see on the ground. But these are, in fact, probably mostly Romano-British rather than Iron Age. And the significance of that I'll just mention in, in a few minutes' time. Field walking in this area. This is Maddle Farm that identified a Romano-British <coughs> villa. And then there's Rams Hill, a hill fort just along from Huffington Castle. This is the Ridgeway, completely ploughed out, but it shows as um, a crop mark, as you can see there, soil mark, and there's been bits of excavation done on it. Now, as we go through this, and sort of part of the reason why we wanted to do this work was because, obviously, we, we're constantly moving from digging up bits of pottery to the bigger questions that we ask of this material. And one of the things that we wanted to question was this concept of continue, continuity. Several speakers have already spoken about continuity. It's a term archaeologists use a lot. We wanted to try and sort of pin this down a little bit. This is the sort of period that we're dealing with, about 1,500 years. Um, and we came up with this idea of prehistoric history particularly as applicable to White Horse Hill, as you will see. Now, you might think this is a bit of a contradiction in terms. Prehistory is defined as before writing. History is usually based on written records. 
But anthropology shows us that people who don't have writing can have a very strong sense of history. And that history is passed on orally, it's passed on verbally, through stories and myths and legends. And quite often, those sorts of ideas are situated in the landscape. So places in the landscape, landscape locales, can act as historical mnemonics. And a mnemonic is a trigger. So we could say that as a group, if we go to a certain place, going to that place will trigger, will remind us of stories and myths to do with our tribe, our identity, our place in the world, our history. You don't need writing to have history. The other thing that we wanted to question was hill forts as a class of site. And this is why we decided to excavate three hill forts very close together. Because as archaeologists, we're very keen on sticking labels on things and saying they're hill forts, which of course implies that they're all very similar in some way, and in some way they are, but it's not until you get down to the details of excavation that you can start identifying differences in many ways. And it's the differences we were interested in rather than the similarities. So let's start with White Horse Hill, and this is very much a complex. So here we've got the hill fort, Offington Castle, the western entrance, we've got the Ridgeway, we've got a linear ditch, late Bronze Age, predates the hill fort, comes up to it, the hill fort's built on the end of the linear ditch. We've got a Neolithic long barrow. It's an earthen long barrow just outside, we've got round barrows, and we've got the White Horse itself. Just outside the western entrance is an enclosure that I'll say, say a little bit about. So we've got, we've got use of this hilltop from the Neolithic, 3rd, 4th millennium BC, right through the early Bronze Age, the Iron Age and the Romano-British period. And of course today is a very popular place to go today. And I'm sure many people who visit it today will be having the same sorts of questions in mind as many of the people in the Romano-British period uh, had when they went there. But I'll talk about that in a minute. So this is looking out of the western entrance, across the um, downlands to the south, and this is where we excavated this little enclosure that shows us um, as a, a soil mark. You can see it just outside the western, in western entrance of the hill fort there. Notice it's got a bit of a trackway associated with it, which heads towards uh, the ridgeway. And this is the linear ditch that comes up to the hill fort. So this enclosure completely ploughed out. You can see that this, this area has been very, very heavily ploughed. And you can see plough marks in the chalk. There's actually a completely ploughed out early Bronze Age round barrow within this enclosure. There's a Roman burial. And this is what's left of the ditch, but we did get some Romano-British 2nd century AD pottery from the bottom of the ditch. So it's definitely a Romano-British enclosure just outside the entrance to the hill fort. So that enclosure is situated on this shoulder of land there. This is the hill fort, the ramparts of the hill fort, and this is the linear ditch going up across the downlands towards the hill fort. This is where it crosses the modern ridgeway. This is the ridgeway, and it shows because this is just after a night of rain, so it, it shows as this sort of um, soil mark across the ridgeway. And this is our section through it. Typical chalk downland linear ditch, V-shaped with a little notch in the bottom. Presumably, well, you can see it's still got a bank on, on one side of it. But notice the stratigraphy here. This dark bit at the bottom is, is late Bronze Age, early Iron Age, natural silting of this ditch. But then from there upwards, this is intentional fill. This has been intentionally filled and then um, this chalk surface laid across the top. And this is the establishment of the ridgeway in the late 1st, 2nd century AD, the Romano-British period in this actual location just to the south of the hill fort. 
The ramp parts, as you can see here, is what we might call the sort of classic um, Wessex sequence, which goes from box ramp part to dump ramp part. And so here you can see the post holes of the first phase box ramp part. This dating is by pottery. Um, because of the C14 complications that Strat spoke about, um, we have very, very good pottery typologies for the later prehistoric period in this part of the world. So the first phase box rampart, 7th century BC. This was replaced by a dump rampart, so the box was completely covered with a mass of material dug from a much, much bigger ditch on the outside, and this dates to the 4th century BC. So in this section, you can see that the red is the first phase, with a little counter scarf bank on the outside of the ditch. You can see the post holes of the box rampart. This had actually be begun to deteriorate when in the 4th century BC, they constructed the second phase dump rampart over the top. And the thing about the dump rampart, instead of presenting a vertical face to the outside world, it presents this continuous slope from the bottom of a much, much bigger ditch to the top of the, of the dump rampart. There's a little revetting wall at the back. So you're presented with this big continuous slope from bottom to top. Interestingly, according to the evidence that we found, there was then a period of abandonment. So there was nothing happening within the hill fort from the 4th century BC until its reuse in the Romano-British period, late 1st century, early 2nd century AD. So we've got four, 500 years where it appears very little was going on inside the hill fort, which is sort of interesting. Um, so these are some of our excavations. This is the ridgeway. This is the linear ditch. This is the um, Romano British enclosure on the outside. To the east is a blocked entrance, which I won't say very much about, although we did excavate it. The blocked entrance is from the first phase box rampart, but then in the fourth century, when they constructed the dump rampart, they built that completely across the blocked eastern entrance. There's the white horse. And this just left the western entrance, which is outturned and the inner rampart connects with the sizeable counter-scarp bank around the outside to produce this sort of corridor passage type entrance that you can see there. In the interior, there was actually very little. Um, we did geophysics, which didn't show very much. There were some pits and some post holes. There was no evidence for houses. Um, but certainly the impression we got from what we excavated in the interior was that Offington Castle was not continuously occupied, it was not densely occupied. It very much gave us the impression that this was a, a sort of central place that people would go to at certain times of the year for short periods of time to take part in certain activities. It was not continuously or densely occupied. And here you can see we're excavating an Iron Age pit and, and this is with the topsoil removed um, to show some features in the chalk. Now, in terms of Romano-British reuse, what we identified on the top of all of the features that we excavated was a very, very artefact-rich Romano-British soil. This is an Iron Age pit and this big, thick wadge of brown stuff on the top is this Romano-British soil. And this was absolutely stuffed full with coins and glass and pottery, all sorts of things um, which were Romano-British. The only feature that we found was this little um, bread oven that you can see here, and that was uh, situated in the middle of the hill fort. Um, just to say a word about the white horse, because it's important to try and situate the white horse chronologically within this sort of sequence that I've just explained. Uh, this is the white horse. 
Uh, we excavated a, a few trenches just to establish that it's still pretty much the same shape as it was originally. During the Second World War, the White Horse was covered over because it, it was felt to be a sort of landmark that the Luftwaffe could, could um, locate themselves by. And after the White Horse, it was, uh, sorry, after the Second World War, it was uncovered by an archaeologist named Grimes. And he was a little bit naughty because he didn't just uncover it, he actually dug a sizable hole into it. And this is the hole that we re-excavated at the so-called beak of the white horse. Uh, for some reason this horse has got a little beak on it. Um, and what we, what we confirmed is that there's about a metre of stratigraphy beneath the white horse. The white horse is not constructed on bedrock. This has been built up over many, many centuries through this process of what's called scouring the white horse. And scouring the white horse is hammering chalk into the surface of the white horse to, to renew the look of it and the shape of it. And this has been going on for a long, long time. Uh, we did some OSL dating, optically stimulated luminescence dating from some of the uh, layers within this stratigraphy and three dates that came out to about a thousand BC but like radiocarbon dates it's a range there's a standard deviation and for OSL dates this is quite considerable so it's plus or minus 300 years if like radiocarbon dates you you take the view that you have to work to two standard deviations so that you get a 95% probability of the date being within that range, then that brings us up uh, to about 400 BC. So the dating of the White Horse is not precise enough, it tells us it's prehistoric, it's not precise enough to tell us whether it's associated with the first phase building of the hill fort, 700 BC, or the second phase remodelling of the hill fort, 400 BC, it could be either of those. But what it does tell us is that it's prehistoric because before the OSL dating, some people argued that it was actually um, late Saxon and it was to do with King Alfred who defeated the Danes in this part of the world in the um, 9th century AD and um, it, it was built as a sort of celebration of Alfred's defeat of the Danes and that certainly is, is not the case. Um, so the story then, if you like, for, the, for Offington Castle, there's a considerable pre hillfort landscape. There's a considerable late Bronze Age landscape, the linear ditch, there are settlements. I haven't got time to go into all of this. We don't know the date of the horse. There's two phases for the hillfort, then a period of abandonment. But according to um, current consensus, the white horse has to be scoured about every 30 years, otherwise it will grow over and you won't see it. Um, so presumably the white horse was being scoured during this whole period when the hill fort was not actually being used. A really interesting time is the second century. This is the Roman Romano-British interest in this site. Here's the Ridgeway. Here's the Western Enclosure. There are also two breaks through the ramparts. One there, which connects with the ridgeway, and one there that connects with the White Horse. And these are Romano-British. These were broken through in 2nd century AD. So what I'm suggesting here is that in the Romano-British period, this became a sort of sacred place, if you like. It's a place that people would go to, um, I think all of the artefacts were deposited in the middle, they weren't just accidentally dropped, they were intentional offerings. My money would be on this being some kind of rural shrine, and the significance of this is shown by the number of um, Romano-British burials, not just the one we excavated there, but in the top of the Neolithic Long Mound, there are over 50 Roman burials stuck in the top of the earthen long barrow. And I think the reason for this is the horse. 
because by the Romano-British period, the white horse could already be four, five, six hundred years old. There would have been myths, there would have been stories associated with the horse. Why was it built? Who built it? And also we know that the Romano-British were very good at sort of taking over indigenous religious places and indigenous religions. They, they adopted them and adapted them to their own interests and their own beliefs. So this is, the, I think, this is what I'm saying about history being inscribed through the landscape by visiting these places over long periods of time, sometimes with big gaps between actual visits. If we move on to Segsbury Camp, <coughs> big hill fort, a uh, relatively modern road going through the middle of it, and this is the Ridgeway. Again, we did geophysics, uh, lots of geophysics, and the geophysics showed us what we called um, house pit groups. There's, the site dates to the 6th to 7th, 2nd centuries BC, so slightly different to Uffington, and it's only about 12 kilometres along the Ridgeway from Uffington. This is a house pit group. Notice there's some sequence here. That's a big roundhouse. There's another roundhouse gully showing there, and there are pits dug over the top of it. So they were dug after that roundhouse was no longer in use. There's intersecting pits, they cut into each other. And what we're suggesting here again is that Segsbury was not permanently occupied. Again, it was a place where a dispersed community living out in farmsteads could go at certain times of the year, take part in festivals, um, exchange their rams, because sheep were very important uh, in this part of the world in the Iron Age, and probably there was a lot of religion and ritual involved in these sorts of meetings, but it was not a permanently occupied site. The rampart was very, very different to Uffington. So there is a chronological overlap, but the rampart was very different. Uh, it started off as a big palisade. It then got bigger and bigger and bigger as a box rampart, and then became a dump rampart at the end. So it's sort of the same sequence, but much more complex. Um, interestingly, in the middle of the rampart, there was this little feature which is made from exotic chalk, and by that we mean this is chalk that is not from Segsbury. This is chalk that has been brought from several kilometres away, it occurs further down the geological column. And interestingly, this was not structural. This was nothing to do with the structure of the rampart. This was just a feature that was put into the rampart as it was being constructed. And one thing that we notice, this is the ditch on the outside, it's an absolutely huge sort of um, bit of civil engineering. One thing we notice was that from the fourth century, so this is after 200 years of rampart construction, the rampart suddenly got much bigger. And we reckoned it would have taken about ten, a tenfold expansion in terms of the number of people involved to build and maintain the rampart. And our pottery person, completely independently, said to us, there's something weird happening with the pottery in the fourth century. It goes from being very local to being much wider in terms of influence. Uh, there was pottery coming from Wiltshire, probably up the Ridgeway. So it seems that in the fourth century, suddenly Segsbury rapidly or quite dramatically increased its area of influence and people were coming from much further afield to take part in building the ramparts and constructing the ramparts. And it could well be that people sort of brought with them bits of their own place to incorporate into the ramparts just to show that they somehow, this was their hill fort and they belonged to it and it belonged to them. So it's all part of this idea of identity. So to, to just summarise Segsbury, um, and this is a very brief summary, it's not permanent, it's periodically reused. Uh, there's a big focus on sheep, 
Um, and in fact, some people have suggested that rather than calling the Iron Age the Iron Age, we should call it the Sheep Age because there's much more evidence for sheep than there is for iron in many parts of the Iron Age. Um, and perhaps the interesting thing is absolutely nothing Roman. And this is only 12 kilometres away from Uffington where there's a massive Roman interest. And I think the reason for that is entirely economic. Um, because the Romans weren't particularly interested in sheep. Um, all of those field systems that we saw from the EH mapping programme are Roman, and that's because the Romans wanted cereals. They grew cereals in this area to feed the Roman army. So the economy changes from being sheep-based to being cereal-based. So the Romans weren't interested in, in Sexbury, but they were interested in Offington for the reason I've already given, but it was much more a sacred ceremonial type of site. Alfred's Castle, the third site we dug, um, you can see this has got a small enclosure and then a much bigger one, and the, big, the bigger one's been completely played out. Um, and, the small, and they both date to uh, the same period, they're contemporary. Again, there's a very long sequence of activity early Bronze Age round barrows, linear ditches aligned on the early Bronze Age round barrows, and then the two enclosures, um, two enclosures which date to about 500 BC to 200, um, and then there's a Romano-British farmstead built in the middle of it, the little rectangular building that you can see there, um, and very little late Saxon. And why I've said very little late Saxon is because of the name of it, Alfred's Castle. Again, you know, that implies that it's to do with King Alfred fighting the Danes, but there's, no, there's really no evidence for that at all. Um, and this is only about, what, eight kilometres away from Uffington, so, you know, the three sites are very close. But you'll see that the structure of the rampart is very, very different to the other two. Here we've got the massive ditch cut into the chalk. The, the front face of the rampart is these big blocks of sarsen stone, which is this sandstone that occurs naturally on top of the chalk. And then there's a chalk bank at the back of it, um, rammed up against the back of the rampart there. In the interior, lots and lots of Iron Age pits, absolutely stuffed full of fantastic material culture. We've got wonderful assemblage of pottery, lots of evidence for working with sheep, weaving, spinning, all sorts of things. And then on top of this was built this little Romano-British farmstead. I hesitate to call it a villa, it depends how you define villa, but it's certainly a farmstead. Um, apparently quite high status, <coughs> built in the late first century AD. It had window glass, um, it had imported pottery from France and it fell into disuse and collapsed in the late 3rd century AD and we've dated that by coins. So Alfred's Castle, this was permanently densely occupied. We got roundhouses as well as pits and all sorts of things. Um, but it's small, would you call it a hill fort? It's certainly very, very different to the other two hill forts very nearby. I mean, we did call it a hill fort, and you'll find it in the atlas if you want to look at the details of it. But it obviously had a very different social role to both Segsbury and Uffington. It could well be that the people who were living in Alfred's Castle were going to Uffington to take place in, in worship and religious events, associated with the horse and they could have well been taking their sheep to Segsbury to trade their rams which is necessary for the health of flocks and um, to trade their rams and take part in other communal sorts of activities. Um, the Romano-British reuse is based on a whole series of so-called villa estates that occur across the, the Berkshire Downs as this area is called. So here, what I'm suggesting is in the Romano-British period, people were selective. You know, they chose to either use or not use existing tough sites, existing places in the landscape, depending on what their interests were 
and what they wanted to do, which is a fairly sort of obvious thing to say, really. Um, so just to remind you that what's also crucial about this is the landscape around these sites. These are field systems in this part of the world from aerial photographs. A few of them still survive uh, extant. This is the mapping of them just south of Segsbury. So, and a little bit of work has been done on trying to date these. They're very difficult things to date through excavation. But the suggestion is that they're mainly Romano-British. So in conclusion for this talk, um, what I'm suggesting is that we question the category of hill fort. Um, you know, they all look similar on the surface, they're banks and ditches, but when you get down to the detail, they can actually be quite different. And this is one of the few projects, if not the only project, that's actually excavated three hill forts that are very, very close together. Um, we're, we're talking about what in, in the sort of trendy jargon these days are called relational landscapes, that you can only understand the site by looking at its relationships with other sites and other places within its landscape. Again, landscape archaeology, fairly obvious thing these days. And we've sort of, um, I think, shown a good example through Uppington Castle of this idea of prehistoric history. People returning to places time and time again because it reinforces their group identity through stories that are associated with particular places in the landscape. Right, that's the end of part one. <laughs> I, need, I now need to load part two. Okay, so um, just to sort of extend the geographical area of context a little bit more, <coughs> we're now moving to North Wales. And this is my um, current excavation at a site called Mauligaya, Fodvari, and it's in Denbyshire. And, and I run this project with my colleague, John Panxit, who's the one <coughs> who's asleep in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> Um, if you're not familiar with this part of the world, then we're here dealing with the Cluidian Mountains in northeast Wales, uh, about four miles outside Denby in Denbyshire. And the reason for, for us being there is because of two or three years ago, a really fantastic project ended called the Heather and Hillforts Project, which was run by Denbyshire County Council. Um, it looked at six hill forts, uh, these are them here, going from Caer Druin uh, northwards to Penny uh, and it did a whole series of earthwork surveys, geophysical survey, and the whole emphasis was on getting the community, they got HLA, Heritage Lottery Fund money, getting community and people involved in it. As a spin-off from that project, um, there are various bits of work that are continuing um, the University of Bangor has been doing some work around Care <coughs> Druin. The University of Liverpool, Rachel Pope, has been doing work at Penny Clothiae, which is the next hill fort, and we're working at Bodvari, uh, which is the northernmost. Now, Bodvari was not included in the Heather and Hill Forts project uh, because at that time it was not in the area of outstanding natural beauty, which has now been extended to incorporate. Um, Botfari and various other places. Um, this, is, this is the site, this is the early Ordnance Survey plan of the site, so just to get a feel for the morphology of it, the eastern side is very poorly understood, um, there's been a lot of um, post-medieval quarrying and, and it's a very, very steep slope, so we, we, we really don't understand the eastern side very well. There's an interned entrance to the north, you can perhaps just see one of the interns there, and all the way down the western side, there is an inner rampart, a big ditch, a second rampart with a big ditch, and then a counterscarp bank, which runs around the outside. Now, if you're not familiar with this term, counterscarp bank, 
uh, the definition of a counterscarp bank is that it doesn't have a ditch. So we've got bank, ditch, bank, ditch, bank. Okay? Um, there was a little bit of excavation done by this local man, Philip Stapleton, in 1908. He dug 10 holes in the top of this hill. Uh, he wrote a report, it's, it, it's a relatively good report, but his plans are absolutely awful. Uh, so we can't locate the actual exact places where he, he dug 10 holes. We know that he dug one across the, the main ditch, the inner ditch, and that's his section drawing of it. Um, and that he dug a hole somewhere in the middle of the western run of ramparts there. And this is his plan of it, and he suggests it's a blocked entrance. So you can see two rampart terminals, and then this row of boulders uh, blocking it. Um, and this is, this is Stapleton's conclusion. If anything can be learned from an exploration which yielded nothing in the shape of a find, it is perhaps that Mulligar was at least never occupied by the Romans. I'd certainly agree with that, and there's nothing to suggest Romans were there. Further than this, the evidence will not carry us. I wouldn't necessarily agree with the second part of that statement. Um, so we decided to use um, a lot of um, uh, technology and one of the things that we did was to work with LiDAR data. Now there's a lot of things you can do with LiDAR data. I mean, you know, you might just get an image, a sort of static LiDAR image, but if you get the actual data, the LiDAR data that underlies the image, you can do a lot of processing with it and pull out all sorts of interesting um, evidence that you wouldn't normally get. So this is a standard LiDAR image. Um, this is what's called analytical hill shading, where um, you, you can interactively move the sun around the site to see uh, different, different aspects of the, of the earthworks, as you can see there. Um, this is particularly useful. This is a process, an analytical process, called curvature analysis. And what this does is that it, it emphasises the tops of slopes and the bottoms of slopes. So here you can see that the red is tops of slopes and the blue is bottom of slopes. Now we wanted to produce a new earthwork survey before we started uh, because the existing one wasn't, wasn't particularly good. It was an old ordnance survey survey. And using curvature analysis was extremely useful, and we use this in conjunction with sort of standard earthwork surveying techniques, walking around the site. And here you can see a sort of correlation of this northwestern corner of the fort, the correlation with the uh, LIDAR curvature analysis and the Hasher, the Hasher plan that we produced. Uh, one of the reasons for wanting to do this is because there was a huge <coughs> amount of bracken, bracken growth over this site, so it was very difficult to pick up the subtleties of, of what you were seeing on the ground, the earthwork. And of course we went back in the middle of winter uh, when the bracken was down to, to check that what we'd done was, was reliable. Um, we also did lots of geophysics. Um, you can see that we tried to do geophysics over the ramparts. Normally in hill forts, geophysics is done in the interior and people don't pay much attention to the ramparts. So we did uh, magnetometry, we did resistivity, we also did ground penetrating radar and we did electrical resistance across a run of the western ramparts uh, because what we wanted to do was to compare all of these different techniques and see what they told us, if anything, about the structure of the ramparts. Um, so these are just two examples. This is the uh, magnetometry. Um, all of the straight lines that you can see are fairly recent post-medieval agri agricultural uh, activity. And in fact, we know from an old, an old man we met in the village that his grandfather used to grow potatoes on the top of this hill. Um, also from the first edition ordnance survey map, 
it shows that the top of this hill was completely wooded. So a lot of these things, some of these anomalies uh, we excavated and their tree throws from, from those earlier trees. We also did a whole series of, of resistance. So from this we, we identified uh, particular areas that we were interested in for excavation and today uh, because of time I'm just going to concentrate on two of these and then finish off by just showing where we're excavating uh, where we were excavating this summer and we'll be back there next summer. So what I'm going to concentrate on is this roundhouse uh, there which is just inside the intern northern entrance um, and it's on an artificial uh, artificially leveled platform and I'm going to concentrate on the inner and middle rampart well particularly the middle rampart there that you can see there um, so first of all the roundhouse um, this shows as a circular uh, a circular anomaly in the geophysics that you can see there. This is the position of it. You can perhaps just see that this is an artificially level platform. So they've hacked away the slope along there and produced this, this level platform. And along the lip of the platform is a bank. Um, and this is the interned northern entrance there. So that's the, the inner rampart which turns inwards there. And this is the intern, this is the eastern intern, the other side of the entrance, which then swings round, but disappears on this eastern side, because that's the side where there's been a lot of quarrying and the ramparts have disappeared. Um, so this is the roundhouse under excavation. Um, this is the Cluidian range running down there. And Penny Clodii, which, which is the next hill fort along, is on top of that hill there. And then the other hill forts are on these hills going down there. Um, and, and to the, to the uh, west is the valley of the River Cluid, and this is the valley of the Wyla. So this is the roundhouse being excavated. Here you can see the bedrock that's been hacked away to produce the platform there. The, the, the junction of the sections there, we excavated in quadrants, that's the centre of the roundhouse. And this is the bank going around the lip of this platform with big um, glacial erratic boulders positioned along the top of the bank there. Um, surrounding the roundhouse there was a metal surface. Um, here you can see it's quite crude but it's definitely artificially laid. So the roundhouse is sort of here, and, and this surrounds it. The roundhouse is on that side of it over there. Um, it's, quite, it's quite believable, I think. Um, the wall material, what caused the geophysical anomaly, was not any form of gully or, or roundhouse foundation. It was actually several large lumps of this clay dorby type material which we think must be the structure of the wall that's completely collapsed. Um, here you can see it's up against the cut of the bedrock um, um, where, the, where the platform was created and the bedrock was cut away. So there's no other evidence other than these lumps of, of clay material that do correlate with the geophysical anomaly. There's no other evidence for the actual structure of the wall itself. Uh, there is a bit of floor surface. This is a compacted surface. Uh, again, this sort of clay material, which again correlates with the geophysical anomaly. So this is inside the roundhouse uh, that you can see there. Um, in North Wales, in the Iron Age, there are very, very few finds. It's a ceramic. For some reason, they didn't use pottery, or at least very little pottery. But certainly in the in Denbighshire, there's, there's no Iron Age pottery. So to actually find something is quite exciting. We've been there for six summers now, and we've got two finds. And those two finds are two stone spindle whirls, and this is one of them found just outside the roundhouse. 
Um, now, of course, you have to make the most of what you've got, but the interesting thing about the spindle wheel being there is that, first of all, it, it, it implies sheep, um, and secondly, it implies that somebody, presumably, was sitting in this house during the Iron Age, and they were spinning wool. So domestic-type activities within the interior of, of the hill fort. Um, we've got a radio carbon date um, from the level just underlying the stone bank. This is a rear revetting stone at the bank that's around the lip of the, of the um, roundhouse. And you can see 367 to 183 Cal BC. And that dates really the beginning of the construction of this bank. Um, if we now move to trench three, uh, which is this one at the southern end, then here we're exploring the middle rampart which is there. The inner rampart around the southwestern part of the site is pretty <coughs> much gone. I mean it's indicated by the geophysics, you can see the black line around there, and it's also indicated by the lidar. But on the ground it's just a slight hump at the top of the break of slope. So the middle rampart is there, and what we call the inner rampart runs along the top of this break of slope. The significance of this I'll, I'll mention in a few minutes time. But what I'm going to show now are the details of the middle rampart. So here we excavated a five meter wide slot through the middle rampart. And the way we decided to do this was to sort of explore half of it first, two and a half metres, so that then when we did the second half, we would sort of have an idea of what it was that we were looking for. Because it was tried quite tricky excavation. The local geology is this shale. And this shale is absolutely horrible stuff. I mean, it fragments very easily. And, and to be honest, how they constructed this rampart and how long it stood up for, I mean, I just don't know, because it's not by any means ideal stone for building from. So this is the first two and a half metres going through here. Um, so what we've got is a massive ditch on the outside. This is a ditch cut through the bedrock. And what you're looking at here, the fill of the ditch, is collapsed rampart material. So this is where the outer face of the rampart and the fill of the rampart has collapsed. And it looks as though there are two phases of collapse. There's one across there and there's one across there. And both of those have got bigger stones which are from the front face of the rampart. Um, so this is the outer ditch. There's a berm which goes across there. It's been over, over dug. This is the berm across there. And this is the outer face of the rampart. You can see there's that horizontal sort of setting of stones. So what we've got in this rampart is an outer face. We've then got two phases of inner face because it was made bigger. And then a third phase, revetting the second phase and filling that, it's a box rampart, and filling it is rubble, shale rubble that you can see there. Um, so this is the outer face looking towards it. You can see there are boulders for the foundation. Again, these are um, glacial erratics creating a, a foundation layer. Uh, and then you can see sort of how crude the building of this rampart is. Um, this is the shale, there's some bigger blocks. And so the fill of it is there. This is looking into the hill fort itself. These are the two phases of the inner rampart, uh, sorry, the inner face. So the outer face is down there somewhere. This is phase one inner face. This is phase two inner face. And all of this middle part was filled with rubble. Um, so we got two radiocarbon dates from this, from material in the layer beneath, so this is a sort of levelling layer, where they were levelling the ground to build the rampart onto, and this is from charcoal, presumably where they were 
burning material to get rid of it before they constructed the rampart. So again, we're taking this as a possible date that indicates the beginning of the building of the phase one rampart. And you can see the two dates, oh, very similar, um, 406 to 353 Cal BC. Um, and looking at this little image here, that's phase one phase, that's phase two phase. You can see the sort of vertical piling, vertical dry stone walling of the faces. And then phase three was just this heap of material stacked up against the face of the phase two rampart with um, internal baffles. And so these were sort of at 90 degrees to the phase two face, and it was probably to give some sort of structure to this revetting bank up against the phase two face. Um, we, we use a lot of photogrammetry. I don't know whether you're familiar with photogrammetry, but it's where you take lots of photographs and then the software stitches them all together. And it can give you this sort of pseudo three-dimensional effect. So this is our photogrammetrical model of the whole of this section. So we've got ditch, we've got outer face, and we've got inner faces there. Compared to the sort of traditional archaeological drawing, I mean, I'm not saying photogrammetry will ever replace traditional drawing, but I think using the two together is, is quite interesting. Because obviously with drawing, it's much more subjective. You're deciding what it is that you're going to draw. And I mean, I probably don't have to tell you this because you're all excavators, but you can't be sitting there in the rain for two days, poking a section with your trowel and trying to decide where the context change, you know, when you're doing your drawing. It's through that process that you actually get to really understand the site. Um, so this is looking down from inside. There's internal quarrying that you can see there. And this is the rampart uh, pretty much removed at the end of the, at the, end of the excavation. Um, so trenches one, two, three, and four were all part of um, what we called phase one of the excavation. And this year we started on phase two. Phase two of the excavation are trenches five and six. Five explores the break through the western entrance. This is Stapleton's possible entrance. And six explores the interned northern entrance uh, that you can see there. Now, one of the reasons why we were keen to explore the western entrance, not just because of Stapleton, but because what we think is going on here, and again this is fairly common for a lot of hill forts, is that we've got phasing. And we've got a first phase univallate enclosure with possibly an intern western entrance. And then we've got second phase multivallation. And part of that second phase multivallation includes the intern northern entrance, rather grand entrance, it includes the roundhouse, which was positioned, I think, to be immediately visible as you came in through the northern entrance. And what we've got is evidence for, from here, trench four, and from here, trench three, for this southwestern quadrant, phase one univallate enclosure rampart being completely robbed out. This is at the top of trench three. Uh, there wasn't much of it left. This is in trench four where you can see outer face and inner face. So around this area, the phase one entrance was completely removed. Whereas in this quadrant, the phase one entrance, the, sorry, the phase one rampart was built over the top of. So the phase two rampart is over the top of phase one. And then for some reason, it swings around and becomes what we call the middle rampart, but really it's phase two rampart. Sorry if this sounds a bit complicated, but um, this is what we think is going on. So the dates that we've got for the, for the middle rampart there and the house are all to do with the phase two 
multivallation. And the phase one enclosure was a much more simple affair. So what we obviously need are dates for the phase one enclosure. And that's what we're trying to get by looking at the western, in, the western area. This is the break through the rampart. This is where Stapleton suggested there was an entrance and that's where we've positioned trench five. And in trench five, we've got evidence for the robbed out phase one um, rampart with what appears to be an interned entrance. This is the possible intern. There's all sorts of interesting structures beginning to emerge. This is a possible guard chamber or guard house associated with this, with this entrance. Um, again, we use photogrammetry. So this is, this is a large area of Trench 5, a photogrammetrical model. So this is the interned entrance. Uh, the phase one rampart goes along this way and it disappears underneath the phase two rampart, which is what we were expecting it to do. This is structure, the possible guard chamber associated with the interned entrance there. Um, I mean, we, we, we will carry on with this next season. So, you know, these are very, very tentative interim conclusions. But all I can say is that it's looking quite promising at the moment. Um, the second trench we're working on is the intern northern entrance. This is the view of it from the bottom of the hill that you can see there. This is the intern entrance. And this is it from just inside. So this is the inner rampart that swings inwards there, that's the intern. And this is the eastern intern where that ranging rod is lying on the ground. And this is where our trench, our trench is positioned to explore this eastern intern and part, uh, part of the passageway that goes within this intern entrance. So again, this is a photogrammetrical model of the whole trench. Um, this is slope. They very much used, if I can just go back, they very much used the natural topography when they were considering and constructing this entrance. So you can see that the intern is at the top of this break of slope there. And that's quite a steep slope that goes down to the rampart where it swings around from the intern entrance. And this is it. Uh, by photogrammetry. So this is the slope going down there, and this is the intern. You can see there's this stone uh, facing wall beginning to emerge. Um, interestingly here, it looks as though there might be two different phases, because that's one facing wall going along there, and then there's this second one that comes around here. So the entrance passage is through there, and this is stone revetted um, intern of the rampart and it's filled with, with shale rubble, the same as the phase two rampart on the western side that I showed is. So again, this is to be explored further next year, next summer, um, but as I say, it is looking very hopeful. Um, so interim conclusions, um, this is a close up of the bank around the roundhouse. Um, we've sort of shown that the geophysics works because it's identified lots of <coughs> things we've confirmed through excavation. Um, we've, there's only evidence for one roundhouse um, which suggests uh, that perhaps again this site was not permanently occupied. So perhaps again we're dealing with a dispersed community <coughs> that lived in farmsteads around these hill forts and coming together in the hill fort was uh, what these days in terms of hill forts is called community building. These people would have come together, they would have um, renewed their social and community relationships, not just through activities within the hill fort, but through the activities of actually building the hill fort, all taking part together in constructing the ramparts and refurbishing the ramparts over a long period of time. Uh, we desperately need to refine the phasing, we need dating 
for the phase one rampart, which we're sort of hopeful about. Um, we, we're not sure about relationships with other Cluidian hill forts. There's very little dating in this area for hill forts. Um, but hopefully the work at Penny Clothii uh, we, will give us a bit of a handle on that. Um, I need to thank various funders. I mean, we get money from uh, Denbyshire County Council and all sorts of other, of other people. And I need to thank Fiona Gale, who's a Denbyshire County Council, Council Archaeologist, CADU, who give us permission to do this, and the landowners who are John and Van Dawson. Okay, thank you very much.